Yeah. So welcome everyone to the uh, meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. It's Tuesday, December 15th, 2020, and this is our regular business meeting. I don't usually call the meeting to order, but you'll see why um, in a moment. So um, the meeting is now called to order. And would you please stand for the salute to the flag? And Jen, would you pull up the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag for the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, divisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the first order of business is the consideration to elect board officers and committee appointments, um, the election of the board chair. Do I have a motion? Um, I uh, nominate Heather Altenberg um, for the uh, chair of the school board. I second for that. Okay, I'll do the roll call. Heather Altenberg. Oh, sorry, is there any discussion? Okay, hearing none. Um, I'll do the roll call. Heather Altenberg. Yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Philip Saucio. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Volts. Yay. Jennifer McVeigh? Yay. Laura Danino? Yay. Congratulations, Madam Chair. Thank you. And you can now take over the meeting. All right. Thank you so much. Um, may I have a motion? Election for board vice chair, please. Um, I nominate Kimberly Carr as school board vice chair. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Laura. So Heather, all, any discussion? Seeing none, Heather Altenberg, yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. <clears throat> Cindy Bolts. Yay. Jennifer McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Nice. So um, next up is the appointment of committees as described as the board caucus on December 14th, last night, 2020. May I have um, a motion? I move we appoint the following committee members as described in the board caucus on, on December 14th, 2020. And as described in our packet, I will read them out uh, for clarity and for the public. So standing committees first as finance chair, Phil Saucier, uh, and uh, for policy, Elizabeth Seifries as chair and Jen McVeigh and Cindy Volts as members. Uh, for committee appointments, for PAVs, Advisory Board, Heather Altenberg and Cindy Volts. For Technology Steering, Cindy Volts. Transportation, transportation Appeals, Heather Altenberg. Building and Grounds, uh, Building Committee Chair, Heather Altenberg. Wellness, myself, Laura Danino. And Negotiations, three members, Phil Saucier, Elizabeth Seifries and Kimberly Carr. Moving on to Advisory Committees, Legislative Liaison, Jen McVeigh, and as an alternate, Kimberly Carr. Dropout Prevention, myself, Laura Danino. Calendar, Heather Altenberg and Kimberly, Kimberly Carr. Sabbatical, myself, Laura Danino. And DEI Task Force Representatives, Heather Altenberg and Jen McVeigh. Thank you, Laura. Second. Thank you, Elizabeth. Is there any discussion? Um, I would just like to say before we head into a vote that last night the board caucused um, to appoint these committees, uh, these committee positions, and it was a wonderful opportunity to get to welcome the new board members, Jen McVeigh and Simi Volts, and um, I was super uh, impressed 
again with this board for their willingness to step up and um, serve the public in various ways. Uh, so thank you. And um, I want to send a sincere welcome to Cindy and Jen. Um, welcome to the board. So uh, heading on to the votes, Heather Allenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Bill Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Volts. Yay. Jennifer McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. So moving on in the agenda, we have adjustments to the agenda. Are there any? Okay. Seeing none. Are there approval, may I have a motion for item three, approval of minutes from November 10th, 2020? I move we approve the minutes from November 10th, 2020. May I have a second? I second that. I missed that. Was that Jen? Uh, Kimberly. Kimberly, okay, sorry. Uh, any questions, discussion, comments? All right, seeing none, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Volts. Yay. Jan McVeigh. Yay. Laura Danino. Yay. yay. So at this point, are there any comments from the public? There are uh, Wynne Phillips, I think you're able to speak. Go ahead and unmute yourself, go ahead. You have three minutes. Yep, I hadn't planned on speaking today, but I saw that Arlene is sitting there and that you, for some reason, have invited her to today's meeting. So I just wanted to say that um, Arlene uh, and I, I believe began working uh, in the Cape Elizabeth School District the same year and, um, and I'm jealous that she has uh, decided to move on. But I also wanna just uh, say how wonderful she has been to work with. She is, um, and has always been incredibly responsive, has always been incredibly pleasant and incredibly knowledge and does her job, uh, has done her job with the utmost professionalism and, um, and good cheer. And so I just wanna say that uh, on behalf of all the teachers who I think would probably second what I say, that we wish her, wish her the best of luck in, in all her endeavors and, and to thank you, uh, Arlene, very much for your service to the Cape Elizabeth School District. Thank you, Wynn, it's been my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Wynn, for that. Are there any other comments? All right, seeing that there are none, uh, comments from student representatives. So welcome Ellie and Joey. Thank you. Um, I'll go first on the club and organization report. Uh, so for student council, the freshmen will roll out their gingerbread house kit fundraiser. Um, the sophomores will begin selling hand sanitizer to raise class funds. Juniors just toured the prom venue, which is the landing in Scarborough, and are starting to figure out what prom will look like if it needs to be outdoors. Um, they're also putting together a Cape Elizabeth sweatshirt fundraiser to sell the community, which we did in the, pre the previous year. And seniors' current candle fundraiser is going very well so far. And now Joey's going to do the achievements to be noted. So some achievements we really want to... Uh, let the board know about and also the members of the community is that uh, last weekend the speech and debate team did very well. The debate team overall came in first, the speech team came overall second, and the congress team came overall third. So we're very proud of everyone involved uh, with that organization. And then on to mock trial. We're so happy that mock trial did so well this year. It's disappointing that the difference between uh, 
championship was only half a point, but nonetheless, some great work uh, being done over in that organization. <laughs> and over the past week, we have put out a poll to the students to determine uh, the effectiveness of the mini term system. And we have some of that data we'd like to present to you tonight. So I think, uh, could I have presentation powers? Or, yes. uh, I'm not sure. I can't do it. Donna, I think you have to do it as the host. Uh, Maybe, Dan, yeah. you can do it. I'm doing it right now. Okay. Okay. You're all set, Joy. Joe, your video is off, so that's probably why we can't see anything. There we go. It's, it's coming along. Mini term evaluation graphics. We can see it. Sweet. So, just to start off this presentation, I wanted to give you a quick look at the overall uh, perception of it, and then we'll go a little bit more in depth in a second. So just generally, we're seeing a nice representative sample uh, in this poll. We're seeing about 20 to 25% of each grade and about 20% of the student body overall. So we know that these uh, results can definitely be taken at their face value. So the first question was, how is your transition back to the mini term one classes? And overall, we're seeing very positive numbers in this regard. So 16.4% uh, very smooth, 62.7% just plain smooth, only 17.2% uh, found it difficult, and 3.7% found it very difficult. Now looking a little bit deeper into those numbers, we asked uh, respondents, what, why was this difficult? Was it uh, indicative of a specific di discipline? So 54% of respondents uh, include science in their answer, 46 include math, 29 included English. So that's not a big surprise to us because those classes are, uh, you need a lot of practice and a lot of reinforcing practice to uh, have it go smoothly. So a little bit of time off is definitely going to make it slightly more difficult. And then overall knowledge retention, we're looking at some pretty good numbers that 4.5% uh, of respondents uh, remembered everything, 52.2% remembered mostly everything, 41.8% uh, remembered some things, and then 1.5% uh, remembered nothing. So we're looking at pretty good numbers uh, there as well. And then we're going to get uh, down into some of the uh, specific comments that students made. Okay, so I'm going to start off quickly with the positives and then Joey's going to do the negatives and then we had a few suggestions. Um, so for the positives, the greatest benefit of the system um, was echoed through the responses of students and is the prevention of COVID-19 within the high school. As shown by recent cases, there was minimal interference in curriculum instruction whilst keeping the staff and the student population safe. An, additive, an added positive is the reduction in workload specifically noted in senior responses helping in application writing for college. Um, the poll also showed clear support for Wednesday support days in keeping with the sentiments the principals and superintendent noted last meeting. Students noted this time period as necessary for both their mental health at the increased pace of curriculum and to interact with teachers. And lastly, the student body also noted the importance of focusing on four classes at a time to further reinforce instruction and maintaining greater focus in those disciplines. And now Joey's gonna take us into negatives. And some of the critical comments we got from students is a little bit of concern, firstly, for AP classes and the whole College Board curriculum and whether uh, with the reduced instruction time, whether we'll be able to reach those standards or whether College Board will change them. So we still await uh, what that will be. So whether the college board can change it or uh, how 
we'll get to that point. And secondly, and I think the most noted example within this poll is that due to this reduction in curriculum time, uh, staff have to put the pedal to the metal in terms of instruction. So once we're back into the mini term, it's usually picking up right where they left off. And a lot of students noted that it's kind of hard to get back in the groove of things after taking a month off. And it would be uh, extremely helpful to have maybe a review day uh, prior to the continuing of instruction. That way they can kind of catch up. But in general, the, this poll is a resounding success and a resounding endorsement of the mini term system. We're getting nothing but positives from it. And uh, the small notes that we have added is, the small notes that we have seen is certainly on um, no big negative against uh, the system that we have in place today. So thank you for uh, making such a well-crafted system. Do any board members have any questions regarding our uh, student report or the poll uh, data we just presented? Thank I you. Do you guys want a job? <laughs> I just want to say, um, God, Heather, they can come work in the yeah, <laughs> thank you so much for that. Um, we hear a lot of perspectives from administrators and I really deeply appreciate the time that you both took in creating this survey and getting this information and um, sharing it with us. So thank you very much. I, um, um, it, it's just, I think it's really important to see the reaction throughout the different groups from administrators to teachers to students and you filled a gap that was not answered. So thank you so much for that, the two of you. Are there any other comments or questions for student reps? Okay, so one of the downfalls of um, Zoom is that we're not in person. And there was a member of the community that did have a public comment earlier um, that I did not notice in time. So I would like to go back to that and invite, it says the Do family um, to speak. It looks like you've got permission to speak. You have three minutes and my apologies for not noticing you before. No problem. Uh, my name's Tim Do. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Thank okay, you. I'm an ed tech at Pond Cove and a parent of three kids at the Cape schools, two at Pond Cove and one at the middle school. I'm following up on my letter to the board from several weeks ago and the subsequent discussion at the last board meeting. My letter was in response to the fact that within the current structure of our hybrid model, our students are only getting two math lessons and just two reading and writing lessons per week. First though, I will echo Jason from the last meeting in his praise for the incredible jobs that our teachers are doing. They are. I will also echo Troy in his observation that despite the smaller class sizes, teachers are indeed stressed. They are. One first grade teacher put it to me this way. Tim, she said, the kids are simply not where we need them to be. Her concern has been echoed literally dozens of times in my many conversations with administration, over a dozen teachers and many staff, including other ed techs and the school nurse. To be certain, there are some who feel that the children will adapt and catch up over time. However, my sense is that the huge majority believe that the ongoing deficit in core instruction is a significant concern. The sentiment underlying most of the feedback I've heard is that the longer we continue with the current model, the further behind our kids are getting. On that note, an important point of clarification, when compared to other schools within this current COVID-19 environment, there's no question we're gonna perform well, at least against that lower bar and at least early on. However, when we instead reflect on where we would normally expect students to be within current, their current grade level, it's not hard to do the math and understand the concern. With such limited core instruction, both students and teachers incur a significant cost. One specific idea that's been advocated for is the model that Falmouth and Boston and many other local and regional districts have employed. That is a half day model in which one cohort comes in the morning and the other in the afternoon. Instead of just two days of core instruction per week, the students would get four. In that model, students would get their core instruction daily at school 
and parents and students would be able to place a higher priority on remote allied arts instruction than they are today. The recent challenges we have all heard in response to this idea are understandable and match up to what we've heard for the last, you know, since this last summer. It's clear that those challenges are primarily around transportation and cleaning. That said, these challenges lead to so many more questions. Based on the hugely significant impact of this and other decisions, I kindly ask the board to provide an ongoing forum for parents, teachers, and staff to assess, evaluate, discuss, and bring brainstorm solutions. Given the current surge in COVID-19 cases, it's easy to imagine throwing in the towel and giving up on any thoughts of any changes to the school year. But we need to consider that there are still six months left and we need to ensure that we're not caught flat-footed while we sit around and, and admire this problem. We need to be prepared and we need to come welcome and we, and we need to welcome more voices to the discussion. Some have suggested reconvening the committee that met, met, that met this summer to discuss these and other related issues. I would ask that whatever forum is thought to be best, we get the ball rolling sooner than later, perhaps meeting sometime before the next board meeting would make the most sense. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, Tim. Appreciate it. I'm looking again and don't see other hands raised or comments. So I'm gonna go back to the agenda. And we are at Donna. Okay, so tonight we are here to acknowledge uh, Arlene Rochefort's retirement after over 20 years of service to Cape Elizabeth. On her application, Arlene wrote over that she filled out over 20 years ago. She wrote, I am a detail oriented, I am detail oriented, take pride in my work and never back down from a challenge. I'm self-motivated, dependable, and I work well with others. I don't know if you remember writing that or not, Arlene, but that was on your application. The interview committee must have been looking for someone with these qualities as Arlene began working for Cape Elizabeth Town and School Department on October 16, uh, 2000 as the Human Resource Coordinator, a position that she has held for just over 20 years. During her work in the district, Arlene has continued to be the model of a lifelong learner. She started right off in December of 2000 by attending a seminar on strategies for effective employee record keeping in Maine and she's continued ever since, keeping updated on important changes that have been made in the areas of health insurance, payroll, and laws pertaining to health benefits, payroll, and labor. She has attended OSHA record keeping trainers, a Maine PERS employee, employer web-based reporting basics workshop, a seminar on payroll law, MEA benefits trust wellness ambassador training, Department of Labor's final Overtime Rules, What Schools Need to Know, sponsored by Drummond Woodson, as well as their Back to School ACA, Open Enrollment for Maine and New Hampshire Schools, and the webinar on the Affordable Care Act and other hot topics in employee benefits for schools. And the list goes on and on of the trainings that uh, Arlene has participated in in order to keep uh, up to date on the ever-changing laws of um, human relations. Over the years, Arlene has helped many employees and her file is full of thank you letters for her work. Literally, there are cards and thank you letters in her file. And it was so much fun reading them. Here are some of the comments that people have made that describe Arlene's help and care. Arlene, thank you for all your assistance and patience during my retirement procedure for benefits. Even with the hundreds of things you're responsible for each day, you always made me feel welcomed and you never rushed through the process. Thanks again for your help. Arlene, thank you for all your help with the overwhelming paperwork. I could not have done it without you. I send my most sincere thanks to you for all the help you rendered me in my retirement transition. My deepest thanks for all your research and double checking on my behalf. Arlene, I can't thank you enough for all of the help that you have been to me for so many years. I'd like to have a recording of all of our phone conversations. 
I would have sounded like a crazy person. You are so patient and do such a good job for everyone. Many thanks. I will always appreciate you. And someone wrote, thank you for helping make my transition to Cape so smooth and enjoyable. You've been a tremendous asset and a resource for me all fall. Thank you for your patience, good humor, and positive attitude. You are the best. And another wrote, thank you for all of your efforts on my behalf. I appreciate all of your guidance and advice. Thank you so much for all of your help recently. I so appreciate your quick response to whatever I asked or needed from you. Your professionalism and understanding really made it easier for me. And for that, I'm grateful. So back to Arlene's description of herself. I am detail-oriented, take pride in my work, and never back down from a challenge. I'm self-motivated, dependable, and I work well with others. Arlene, you have more than proven your self-description. You have been detail-oriented, you have taken pride in your work, and you have not backed down from the many challenges that present themselves in this position. You have helped so many people in the 20 years that you've worked for Cape Elizabeth. We wish you the best in your retirement and we will miss you. And now Matt's going to say a few words. Matt? Thank you, Donna. Uh, I appreciate being invited to the Arlene Rochford Roast, and uh, I'll try to keep it uh, G-rated. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I was told 20 years ago by Michael McGovern on my first day of work that Arlene Rochford is the most important person in the building, uh, primarily because she took care of compensation, and that's a fact that I've kept in the front of my mind since day one and have, uh, have found that to be proven true day in and day out every day that I've worked with her. I've never worked with probably a more personal, positive and professional person. And since this is uh, the school board, I hope you appreciate my alliteration because I could go on for, for many an hour with the superlatives regarding Arlene and the pleasure of working with her. She has been such an asset to the community and to all of the employees for her tenure and does it day in and day out with a smile. And this past year has been an incredible challenge and one that, you know, many days it was, uh, you know, there may have been three or four of us in the building at a time and it was Arlene and myself and a couple others at times. And, uh, you know, it was just amazing to see her troop through knowing that it was her last year and uh, to keep going forward and just the consummate professional. and. Across the state, she is held in that same regard. When I would go to insurance, uh, uh, you know, as a as a first year manager and second year manager, I would go to insurance seminars, and people would say, "Oh, you work with Arlene," instead of, uh, you know, they'd be the first person that they would mention. So she made she has made an impact. She has made an impression, and she has earned an extremely, which uh, I would say, I hope, uh, an extremely long, successful, healthy, and happy retirement. And she leaves some big shoes, uh, big shoes to fill, which, uh, you know, we're, we may not be able to fill them. We'll have to buy a whole different set. Uh, <laughs> but I, I look forward to, uh, to hearing of her, of her very successful retirement and hope she keeps us updated in the future. And just really am grateful for having the opportunity to work with her because she has been a true joy. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak, to speak on, uh, on my experience with Arlene. And uh, I, I hope you all have a great rest of your meeting. So thank you for that. Thanks, Matt. Marcy? Yes, thank you, Donna. I have had the honor of working with Arlene since June of 2019. And I feel so grateful that I've had this time with you, Arlene, in the business office. Arlene has spread, not only does she have a wealth of knowledge, but every day she spreads joy and a positive attitude and, and provides a great atmosphere for us. Especially this year, Matt, as you mentioned during COVID, we never were down. We were ha having fun with Arlene and her positivity and always feeling hopeful and moving forward. And she wouldn't let us. That's the only, that's the motto, move forward. <laughs> so, um, so we're all very sad in our office to see Arlene retire, but we're so happy for her at the same time. And we're taking advantage of every moment we have left with her and we just enjoy every minute and Cape Elizabeth will truly miss you, Arlene. Does, does anybody else have anything they'd like to say? I love her. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, Jason? Yes, yeah, just uh, just from the perspective um, from one of the one of the schools, a building principal, Arlene has been absolutely amazing uh, and always available and so responsive uh, and just so kind and, and accommodating. So thank you, Arlene. Yeah, and I would add, um, you know, I was going to talk about Arlene anyways, and everybody's already kind of said it, but you're always nervous when you go into a new place and a new job and you kind of make some judgments on the first people you meet really um, about the whole district and the whole organization. And there was, there could not have been a better front person for our schools than Arlene. Like she just, she not only was helpful, but was very patient. And that's kind of hard to do sometimes when I'm asking you 47 times, you know, how do I claim this? What do I do in this form? What is, so, um, you know, she's just, we're going to miss her a lot. And Arlene is one of those people that no matter what, you don't have to worry. You can call and, and just kind of say it how it is and not be judged for it. It's a judgment free zone with Arlene. And, and I really appreciate that. So um, thank you, Arlene. And, and we'll definitely miss you. May I say thank you, Donna? Yes, Arlene. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am speechless. Uh, I certainly can't compete with what all of you have said, but I want to just thank all of you for the kind words. And I want the board to know that I have just loved working for Cape Elizabeth for the past 20 years, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. And um, it has been an honor and a pleasure to um, serve all of the employees of Cape Elizabeth. So I want to thank you all. I'm going to miss you all very much. Um, I've made some great friends at Cape Elizabeth, but it is time to move on to retirement and uh, spend time with my family and traveling, but I won't forget you and I will stop by when I'm in town. So thank you all so very much. It means a lot. We'll miss you, Colleen. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you for all of that, everyone. Um, it's hard to move on from that, but next up, uh, good luck with your endeavors, Arlene, and thank you. We have uh, Jeff Thorak giving us an update, I believe, on winter sports. There he is. All right. Um, again, thank you, Arlene, for, for all of your support and best wishes with your future endeavors. Um, we're going to, we're, we're certainly going to miss you. So thank you for everything. Um, for athletics, this is our second week of high school winter sports. And uh, per the main department of um, health and human services in the main CDC, Cumberland County still remains to be designated green. Um, so this means in-person athletics for low and moderate risk activities um, are, are a go. And um, that is something that is determined now on a weekly basis. That was um, originally something that was done on a, um, every two weeks, but with um, where we are, uh, that has changed. So we are, um, everyone tends to be looking at following this on their computer or on their TV every Friday around one o'clock or 2 p.m. Um, to see where each county and their where they are with their designation, color designation. Um, so as I'd mentioned, the low and moderate risk activities are go. And um, currently we're in a level one and two. So that means skills, drills, and conditioning only. So they can have team-based activities and practices, but um, groups are physically uh, distanced and activities are limited to um, basically strength, agility, um, individual skill work. And um, what I kind of wanted to do was, oh, and so the next phase, so we're level one and two, the next phase for would be level three, and this would be January 4th, if all goes accordingly, um, we will probably have more uh, an update by January 1st as to whether we remain level one or two, or if we move into level three. 
Um, so level three would look more like a traditional practice. Um, it's one cohort, so one team and face masks would be worn at all times. Um, and then January 11th is the projected date for level four, which would look similar to what we did in the fall with competitions between teams from the same geographic area. Um, so I thought it would be helpful for the board to kind of get an idea of what, um, what level one and two, what a, you know, a typical practice at the, at the high school looks like. So um, to begin face coverings are worn at all times. Um, as soon as they leave the vehicle throughout their practice and after practice and when they head back to their vehicle. Um, so this is a slight change from the fall when masks could be removed when exercising or in competition. So now face coverings must be worn at all times. Um, students arrive dressed and ready to participate. So there are no locker room facilities and this includes um, off-site off facilities as well. Um, so currently we're using the gym, uh, we use the track, the parking lot, um, multiple ice arenas and uh, the swing pool. Um, our coaching staff and the athletic trainer will take attendance. Um, they review the screening questions with each student as they arrive, uh, and then also check our daily eligibility lists. Um, at that same time, students are hand sanitizing when they enter the facility. And um, once they enter, they're assigned to a designated area in that part of the, um, so for instance, in the, for the gym area, uh, when there's a practice there, uh, the first group of students would come in and drop their bags, jackets, gear off at a location in the hallway. So each student has a, a desk that they would use. Um, and that's where they'd also put on shoes or any necessary equipment as well. Um, we build in about 15 minutes between groups to use for disinfecting and cleaning. Um, and allow for some ventilation as well. Um, when that group enters, the, whether it be the gym, pool, or a rink, um, we've tried to keep our numbers around 20. In the pool, there are, there's a um, maximum of 18, so it's three in each lane. Um, ice arenas vary from 20 to 30 students, or students and staff in um, total. Um, and then within those groups, within that uh, one cohort, there will be multiple groups uh, just to ensure some social distancing. Uh, and as I'd mentioned earlier, at this point, we're strictly with um, skill development and, and conditioning. So there's no defending, there's no one-on-one -on -one or any type of scrimmaging. Um, throughout a practice, there are multiple water breaks for and hand sanitizing breaks. And this is a time where um, we would disinfect equipment uh, if it's shared and um, for offsite coaches. So for instance, at an ice arena, each coach has a, a kit and that includes hand sanitizer, that includes disinfectant, um, towels, masks, gloves. Um, so uh, just to ensure that those, those safety precautions are in place. Um, there is a transition, as I'd mentioned, in between groups and in between practices. Um, so things have been working pretty well. Actually, I think the fall, we learned a lot from those experiences. Um, coming inside was a little different, just given the, the size and facility constraints. Uh, but I think in general, I was, I was pleasantly pleased with how things went that, that first week. Um, I think we were all a little, a little nervous that first day or two, but um, it didn't take long to build routines and, and get things going and, and everyone's buying into it, which is great. Um, and even in our gym where we're taking down a part of that gym, moving some of the mats and tables, we have groups doing that in the beginning and at the end, um, it looks exactly the way it would look um, during the school day. Things are in perfect rows. The kids are doing a good job of um, putting that area back to the way it was when they, when they arrived. Um, so now 
we're working, Scott Labby and I are working on some, looking at some options for the middle school. Um, this is a little more complicated just given the facility size and some of those logistics, but we're hoping that may possibly something in January, um, similar to what we're doing now. Um, and we'll have more information to come, come soon on that. But, so that's a little bit of a look at a typical day in the uh, after school and happy to entertain any questions or. Do any board members have questions or inquiries for Jeff? So Jeff, I think it's incredible, right? That you were working so hard to try to provide these extracurricular activities for students where um, some of them desperately need it um, and thrive off of it. And it helps keep them stable and balanced and um, it gives them what they need to move forward and um, you know tackle their academics. Um, some kids really uh, thrive with the sports in their lives. So thank you for your creativity. Thank you for, uh, you know, like we said so many times for teachers, nobody expected athletics to be this way. And so um, I know you're working really hard to provide what you can for the students. So much appreciation your way. Sure. No, it's been, it's been great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, moving on, um, we have Energy Committee, uh, introduction to the Energy Committee. I'm not sure who's speaking. My guess is Perry? Yeah, I, I guess I'll kick it off. Um, looks like we have four of our seven members of the committee here. Um, As attendees? Yes, John okay. Volts. Yep. Richard Parker. Sam Milton and Thomas Murley. Okay. And I just wanted to kind of give a brief, you know, I, I, I serve as the uh, town liaison to the energy committee. Um, the, the, these people are truly the professionals. It's, it's what most of them do for a living and uh, they are very good at what they do. But anyway, the, the charge for the committee is to make recommendations to the town council on achieving environment sustainability goals while lowering energy costs, we explore recommended opportunity or we explore and recommend opportunities for grant applications, conduct public education and promotion of sustainable energy, including but not limited to activities in neighboring communities. And with that, I am going to hand it off to Sam Milton to start it off. Is he here? He is an attendees. Yeah, if we could bring think, him in. Yeah, I think that would have to be Don or Jen. There he is. Oh, there he is. Okay. Sam, Sam is the chairman of the Energy Committee. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we'll get into like a brief description of what we do. We, we do meet uh, every third Thursday of every month and uh, usually a typical two, two and a half hour meeting. And um, yeah, Sam, Sam's the chair and they'll let you know what what we have going on, what's coming on in the future, and questions and answers. Can you hear me, Sam? I think he's- Yes, I can. Hi, Perry, how are you? Oh, okay. All right. Can you hear me, everybody? Yes. Yeah, I don't know if you wanna un- or give video out so that we can actually see you. Your picture's nice, but, <laughs> and if not, that's fine too. My, Sorry, that option. No, my, 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 um, my camera phone, the, yeah, the camera. Okay, that's fine. Um, so, thank you for being here. Again, no, no problem. A pleasure. Thank you for having us. This is really great. And um, as a parent of a, uh, a ninth grader and a fifth grader, so you guys have done amazing work. Um, the decision has been very, very fraught, clearly, um, but um, we've been very happy. So, thank you for all the work you're doing. And, um, and uh, anyway, we're, we're here to we advise the town, as Perry mentioned, on um, energy issues and opportunities to, to save energy and save money. Um, and with that, we wanted to just kind of um, let you know kind of things that, that, are, that we're seeing on our radar um, as it relates to energy things opportunities at the, um, at the school building. 
Um, as you probably know, um, this school campus um, is by far the largest um, consumer of power in town. Um, and with that, and a very big target, you know, on our, um, on our minds. Um, and we're always thinking about ways to, to help you um, find a way to, um, to come operate the school in a, a more efficient manner. Um, and um, actually, if, if you could queue up um, Tom Murley, he's going to give us a, a deeper dive into, um, into kind of what we can do, what we can offer, and what we can recommend. Um, that'd be great. Um, but um, yeah, there's lots that we can do, certainly on the renewable energy side, on the energy efficiency side. Um, and by saying we can do, we can you know, help connect the dots um, for the town and opportunities them out there in the, in the, in the marketplace. Um, so um, so I'll, I'll, I'll pass it over to Tom. Um, and uh, I, am, I am the chair, but I'm only, uh, I, I, I had the, the luxury and pleasure of, of uh, chairing the meetings, but I have a great team of folks uh, who we work with. Um, and I'm glad to introduce you to, to Tom and Richard tonight. Um, Tom, are you, are you up yet? Yeah, I'm up. Uh, thanks, okay. Sam. And, and thank you, Perry. Um, I'm Tom Murley and a, just a little bit of background in the energy committee. I've been in the renewable energy business um, in the United States and overseas now for over, over 30 years. Um, started my career in Maine and then we lived in Europe for a long time. And um, I think my experience is very much typical of the energy committee. We are all Mostly we've all come from technical backgrounds, engineering, we're deeply involved in the space and have a lot of experience between the actual doing, financing and the like. Um, and some things that may be applicable for the school committee as you're, you're thinking about you know, the town and the like. For example, we did all the work as the committee of writing and evaluating the RFP to put the, uh, the solar that's going in on the town's landfill got it all in, all the economic analysis presented that, you know, the options, managed that, that whole bidding price process and got it into a place and helped advise the town on the contracts and the like to get that in place. So we can bring a real skill set to the energy needs across a broad, again, across a broad spectrum analysis and the like. I think for the school, clearly as the big energy user, um, the big thing at the moment is around energy efficiency and I know that in, in talking to Perry, you, the schools have actually already done a huge amount, whether it's LED lighting, swapping out some of the, the chillers and other things in there to get more efficient things in it, into the school. And I think clearly the big prize in terms of the schools are going to be with whether new buildings or renovations, how you integrate energy efficiency into that. And one of the, the businesses that I'm, I'm lucky to serve on the board of directors of is a company called Amoresco, which is, and I'm not shilling for them to be clear, but just to give an example, um, that has been in the energy efficiency business for over 40 years. And a lot of it used to be with various, you know, municipalities, schools, hospitals, sort of going in and putting in more efficient chillers or motors or heating control systems. But in the last 10 years, um, this business is, has really changed in terms of what people can do with energy efficiency in public buildings. And we can still do all the things of better insulation, more efficient lighting, but we can now also do things like put batteries in the basement of a school. And there are some times of the day the electricity is more expensive than other times of the day, typically in the middle of the day. And you can make a decision to run off the battery for a period of time. Businesses are doing this and saving on electricity bills. There are these now concepts of things we call microgrids that may be part of the school in the center of town could be part of one with some integrated solar. There are now options, for example, for heating needs that are fueled with oil and gas to bring in the equivalent of green gas through an, a pipeline network. There are a whole bunch of things that we're seeing doing in that business in big schools, small schools, university campuses. And there are also some increasingly innovative ways to financing it. And I know that you're looking at a big uh, potentially budget increase for the schools. There are ways that in terms of either retrofitting existing buildings uh, for more energy efficiency or in new buildings, 
the energy component can be taken out and financed by energy efficiency companies like Siemens or Honeywell who will provide the financing. And then that leaves more of your bonding or other capital capacity, not for the energy, but for other school things within the bond issue. So there's some things going on there in addition to the, all the things, the tools that are increasingly in a toolbox to make schools and other public buildings more energy efficient. There's some innovative ways to finance it, which could leave more capital available for other school needs. And I know that's a lot to absorb. We don't have a lot of time, but I thought that was sort of a good place to start and happy to take any questions or hear from any of my fellow committee members. Are there other committee members, um, I see that they're here that would like to speak up from the energy committee? I know a few of us wanted us to be here to um, uh, just you know, to, to show our, uh, our our support for um, the, the work that we can do. Um, so I don't everybody, everybody has um, remarks that they want to add. Um, so I know that um, that we want to be a part of, of this meeting is trying to you know, share with what we can do. Um, so I was going to thank you for that. I think it'd be fair to say as you approach the work on the schools in the coming years, I think you know. There's a whole bunch to go into it, but I think we could probably help with better decisions and questions and getting a better result around the energy impact on the schools. And that we're clearly happy to help pitch in. We view that as part of our remit. That is amazing to hear. And um, we, that is definitely, I, I wrote it down. I wrote your name down. <laughs> I'm going to be calling you. <laughs> so um, I'm really glad that all of you are here tonight and, and sharing what um, you have to share. It's amazing the depth of knowledge and information. Um, so thank you. Are there any questions from board members? And there, can I just add a little bit to the? Absolutely, Perry. I, I just wanted to kind of point out that we do have the solar project currently going on right now, and that is really an illegal part of it and the design and just getting all the T's crossed and the I's dotted with the legalities and uh, environmental and getting getting our our spot in reserve to get on the grid is, is basically how you look at it, uh, basically tie into the substation that's located over by uh, public works area. You got to kind of get in line. Luckily, it doesn't seem like there is a line in Cape Elizabeth, so that part shouldn't be a problem. So, th so that pro current project is been passed off to uh, town hall and town manager and town council are working the logistics with that, um, and and that will be a savings in all town-owned buildings, including the schools. That 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 savings is spread across all the buildings within the within the town that the town owns. We also have out a grant right now, we put in a grant to uh, get, I believe it's four total charging stations for electrical vehicles. Um, it has the capability, each one has the capability of charging two cars. Uh, four of those, are, I'm sorry, two of those, which would actually be four charging stations, would be located down at Fort Williams and the other location would be the community center, which um, the kind of the, the idea behind the community center was also the, the ease of access to electricity, but also uh, teaching staff would be able to take advantage of that and charge their cars while they're at work. Um, and we're, we're currently, we're, I won't get in too much to it. We're also pursuing other, other uh, options to go along with the solar project where we get our energy cost at a, a little bit of a lower rate. Again, my professional committee here <laughs> knows all the details of that part of that. Um, but also we're working to, uh, uh, Sam is currently working on the idea of getting a, uh, where we can meet with the public. I don't know whether that'll be in person or via Zoom, but Kind of, kind of work with the community members or, or anybody who, who wants to attend uh, to learn a little bit more about the uh, solar 
and other options out there for your, your for your personal homes and your personal knowledge and and hopefully um, and just, just help people understand the opportunities that are out there and how exactly it works. There's a lot of there's a lot of fine print in in the contracts and and the uh, flyers that you're sent from uh, the solar providers, for example, and what they want to do is help people weed through that fine print and what what those things actually mean. So there'll be more to come on that as well, as far as a community based um, workshop or, or whatever you want to call it, expo, things like that. I think one thing that just Perry just mentioned, and I hopefully Richard or John will correct me if I'm wrong, but once we get the solar up and running on the um, on the town landfill site, that's going to on average save the town around um, seventy-five thousand dollars a year in electricity bills. Which um, someone I was talking to yesterday said that's two school teachers. Um, go ahead, Phil. Yeah, just briefly, I just want to thank this uh, the members of the committee for this presentation. I think the work you're doing is going to be very important as we move forward with our building committee discussions. Um, so I appreciate you getting in very early on. Obviously, we're going to talk about that a little bit later tonight, um, but there's a lot of work to do there. And I, we heard from num a number of members of the building committee um, concerns and interest in conservation and, um, and those kinds of things. And so anything we do going forward, I think, energy efficiency and conservation um, needs to be part of it. So um, I appreciate that. I'm also very familiar with these kinds of agreements in my work as well uh, for municipalities. And so I think we should look hard uh, at what we can do with any new building in addition to what we're doing um, at the landfill. So this is, thank you for very, very much. This is, this is John Voltz. Can you go ahead, John. Yes, go ahead. I'll just ch chime in briefly. What uh, Tom was talking about in terms of financing and opportunity is something to keep in mind, partly because school districts uh, are attractive clients for some of these contracts because they're, they're good credits and what they offer is exactly what school districts want. So part of the advantage of particularly things in renewable energy, things are often capital costs that require capital up front and deliver savings over time. When you finance that, you're trading that for a series of fixed payments. Those fit very well with what a school district needs and wants. It funds itself once a year, has fixed payments without volatility that you'll see in commodity energy prices. So as you're planning forward, what's helpful to think about when you're looking at your buildings is how long is it really going to be until you break ground on those new school buildings for the middle and the, the elementary school? And how long is it going to be that the high school is in place? Because then you can look at those existing energy profiles with um, looking at any projects within those under those time frames, And then when you're in the process of doing the building piece, you're gonna be looking to how do you leverage off what you're putting in both for the, the school and potentially for the town from an energy point of view. Thank you, John. Um, I just want to clarify one thing, and Perry, you alluded or didn't allude, you mentioned this, but I just want to lay it out for board members to make sure they didn't miss this. Am I under the correct understanding that a couple weeks back, the town council um, voted in a contract with a solar energy company and that there is the, by the landfill, there is a solar field, is that the right language, and that it is benefiting not just the town, but the school as well. And so we are currently in a position where the one town concept is benefiting us and we are receiving electricity from this solar energy that was created from this group, right? Am I correct yeah. in all of that? Yeah, Heather, I can, I can read you from that. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, it's true that we've, we've um, uh, basically contracted with a solar developer um, for them to install about a megawatt of solar panels by the landfill. Um, and they're, you know, uh, you know, about three quarters of the town's power, the town being 
uh, the town government power, including the schools, uh, will be met by that solar development, um, which is which is pretty remarkable. Um, that will come online in about a year and a half. Um, but um, but that definitely helps to you know to reduce the um, the electricity costs, um, and a large part of that will you know, will obviously be met by the, the schools' um, energy needs too. Um, again, that's just one, one, one small part of it, and they're hopefully we'll be able to, you know, to get more solar power um, from other, other communities to kind of to make up for that difference. Um, but yeah. I, and Heather, I think the thing cool to add to somehow probably adopt some of the, yeah, 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 good. Oh, Heather, I would add to that in terms of the contract, and this talks about the financing thing, the cost to the town is a few thousand dollars in legal fees to negotiate the contract. So that solar company will provide all the financing, build it, operate it for 20 plus years. The town will buy the electricity and basically save off what it's paying from CMP, you know, across the town. So a big budget savings, but it also just shows the power of things you can use. So the town's benefiting from the savings with no upfront costs or impact on the taxpayer. Yeah, which is amazing. And the connection I'm trying to make is that as part of the town, the schools are receiving some of that as well. Yeah. Correct, yeah. Tom? Yeah. Yeah, which I, right. I, I was not aware of that and I'm not sure other board members are. And I just wanna make sure board members are understanding that. Okay. Thank you so much for the work that you have all done and the savings that you have created. We all know how important every penny is. So thank you. And thank you for being here tonight. If there's no more questions, which I'm not, yeah. Heather, I just wanted to finish up with, you know, with, we are a committee appointed by the town, but we are completely accessible to the school board and the school as well. Um, yeah. the, the committee is basically in standby mode right now to meet with any engineers or architects in, in the route that we go in the future with our buildings um, and, and, and are excited about the opportunity to meet with them and, and share some ideas and thoughts for the uh, future of the buildings. We will not forget that. Absolutely. We will not forget that. So thank you, Perry. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and thank Sam, you so thank you to you and all your committee members that came tonight. Pleasure, anytime. Have a good night. Um, next up, we have principals. Let's start with Jeff tonight. How's that? Wow. <coughs> Just trying to shake things up a little bit. Um, so no, I'm happy to start. I, I just. When Arlene was here, and I know she's not here right now, I, I didn't pipe in, even though I've known her a very, very long time. She and I have talked privately about my feelings about her, and so I'm, I don't have any concerns about that. Um, she knows how much she's appreciated by me and by everybody. I, I did want to share this perspective um, that occurred to me after Arlene left, and that is that if, if you'd asked me about a year ago uh, this time, who are the three most important bedrock people in the Cape Elizabeth schools? Um, the three people that I, I would have named uh, were, would have been in no particular order, uh, Pat Fowler, Janet Hoskin, and Arlene Rochefort. Um, and they have all now left within the last two months. And that is, those are big, big, big holes to fill. And the folks who are there, uh, I think are doing a really good job, but those are really big shoes to fill. Uh, just remarkable people. Um, so and Jeff, I'm just gonna chime in and say, <clears throat> there's another big set of shoes that's gonna have to be filled soon. But no. go ahead. Keep going. Oh, okay. Um, so anyway. Um, we'll talk about uh, that later. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. We still got you for a little while. So we're gonna milk it for all it's worth. Go ahead. Between Ellie and uh, Joey and Jeff Thorek, actually, some of the, the themes that I really wanted to talk about, I'm just going to add, elaborate a little bit, because uh, what I thought I might do is just talk about the all of the extracurricular activities that are happening these days um, to say thank you to all of the coaches and all of the teachers and all of the advisors who are making those things uh, uh, available. 
All of our class advisors are working really hard with their classes to provide as many normal experiences for students as they possibly can. Um, I think most board members, if not all, enjoyed um, the Halloween-based theater video that took place on Hannaford Field recently, which was a wonderful production. Um, uh, I don't remember, Joey mentioned, or maybe it was Ali, I can't remember which of you mentioned mock trial. I think it was Joey who, who certainly did a fantastic job uh, in, a, again, in an entirely virtual competition. Um, speech and debate is doing a great job, again, debating entirely virtually statewide, which I think nobody would have ever imagined that uh, six months ago. And now it's sort of become a part of the routine. Um, our, our math team is competing virtually and doing very well. Um, in fact, I think the last math meet, I think they came ahead of, I'm not saying that we are better than, but I'm going to say that for that one math meet, at least, we came ahead of the main school of science and mathematics, uh, which, was, which was a nice accomplishment. Um, at the most recent math meet, senior Katie Lee scored a perfect score, uh, which is the first perfect score one of our students has had in several years. Um, our jazz band is beginning to rehearse. And if you know anything about the restrictions on music, you understand how hard it is to get music in particular going. But Mr. Wheeler is working as hard as he can at it and kids are beginning to dust off their instruments and, and begin to play jazz a little bit again, again, all virtually. Um, Esports was wonderfully started with the support of the board last year. And that one is actually the most easily adaptable to virtual competitions. And there's a number of students who are involved in that. It's a great opportunity. Um, Natural Helpers is going, the Honor, the Honor Society, the Art Club is going. There's a whole lot of co-curricular and extracurricular activities that are going on. And, and it's, it's really due to the extra efforts above and beyond. Um, and then I just wanted to mention, Jeff has already talked about the work of coaches. Jeff and I were talking earlier today and I, it, it hit me that one of the things that I think is happening because of the way uh, the athletic teams have had to cut down the number of students who are participating any one time, but in fact, there's still a lot of students involved that it means, it means extra commitment and extra hours for coaches. Um, and they're jumping in and filling in and, and they're just doing a remarkable job. I attended a meeting yesterday. Um, I, I won't go into any details at all, but it was an opportunity to talk to a parent who has a student um, who does one of our sports. And the parent was saying that just in one week of uh, fall, since winter athletics started as, to the extent that it has last week, um, this parent has noticed a sea change um, in her child's attitude, um, sort of um, well-being, sense of optimism, sense of hope, and those sorts of things. And uh, whatever sports looks like um, during the winter, whether there's competitions or whatever competitions look like, just the opportunity, and I think you alluded to this, Heather, of having the opportunity of kids getting out and about and being with friends, being with teammates, getting exercise, it is just so critical. So I wanted to just highlight the work of the extracurricular advisors and teachers. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. Are there any questions for Jeff? All right, Troy, our middle school principal. All right, thank you. We have, um, it's always hard because I come here with notes and then everybody talks about parts of everything that I was gonna talk about and then I hear Jeff talk and it reminds me of other things. So um, honestly, what, what's kind of gone on at the middle school and I, and I feel like, you know, it's hard to believe we've reached winter break. I think none of us were sure how this whole fall was gonna go and where we would be. And, and I think when you think about the, the impressive like undertaking to change basically every aspect of how school runs um, from the board to the administration to busing and technology and food. Like there's a lot there to go on. Um, so I think we often get caught up in kind of the grind of things and don't really realize where we've come from. So that, I, and I think we don't really, I think we're hesitant to sometime take a minute to kind of congratulate the successes. But um, so we have definitely hit a nice stride. I feel like at the middle school uh, thing, and some things I think are worth always maybe keeping, but like our parent drop-off loops, and we have to remember there's only about half of our students coming. So it, it seems nice. 
and I'm sure with all that it would not be, maybe. But um, there are certain things that we have come to really realize maybe the way we've always done them wasn't the only way. Um, so that's kind of some things we're looking at. What would we want to you know, change or tweak or keep as we kind of move forward? And, and that's been powerful. But just this last week, and I won't steal Kathy Sunder, I'm sure that's what she's going to talk about. We had to do some PD um, around you know, the district-wide goals and, and make action steps and how we were going to do that. And there may have been a little reluctance to do that because everybody's overwhelmed with just the state of school at times and, and everything that's on the teacher's plates. And um, I've got to say, it ended up being a really good experience at the middle school because it caused us to stop and reflect on what we really already value and what we already do and how closely they kind of currently align with our goals. And, and it was refreshing to say, oh, yeah, we do that. Oh, yeah, we do that. Oh, yeah, we do that. And and I think people, that little bit of time, I think was really refreshing for people. So that I think was a huge celebration. Um, I am in the lunchroom every day, twice for lunch duty. Um, and Kyle's in the other room for that. And to see, it's just the things we could take for granted so easily to see how well the, the food services that everybody is working to kind of just make this happen is really impressive for me and energizing. So we've got some plans. We're starting to plan for a second semester. Um, I think we've had about eight parents kind of that have notified us of um, interest in switching either from remote to hybrid or hybrid to remote in the second semester. Um, so that's kind of on the schedule and we're working out those, those transitions. And then I think lastly, it is so impressive. We're starting to do observations and getting into these rooms and, and virtually into the rooms. So impressive what our teachers have done and what they've become. Um, you know, some of the things they are doing is amazing. You walk into Caitlin Ramsey's room or Emily LeBourne's room for music, and it's, it is full on music. Um, and, and it's just really, really impressive. Um, our world language teachers are, are doing the same things remotely. And so it's, it's really all there. Um, and, and just, there is a lot of time into the schedule already for, whoops, that's not that little dog. That's a much bigger dog barking. Um, there is, uh, a lot of time built in, we did kind of go out and, and we found a computer program to, to support where every kid can, instead of having to get a tutor, if that's how the parents are feeling, can log on to our Ascend program. It places kids, it teaches them and instructs them with lessons. Um, so we are building in and trying to kind of supplement our school days in that kind of a way for families and kids. So, so we are working on that as well. Just, you know, so the, that comment in the beginning, um, I think there's a lot happening towards that stuff that we're, we're pretty proud of. So um, I think that's it. Any questions for me? Thanks. Thanks, Troy. Thanks, Troy. Go ahead, Jason. Okay. I think I'm unmuted. I can hear you. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to share tonight. Uh, just, I just, I'll be brief. Um, start with a couple celebrations. Uh, I certainly won't deny that there have been a lot of challenges this fall, but um, there are definitely things to celebrate. Um, just start by thanking the Pond Cove students and teachers and families for coming together to make this work. We're all learning a lot about flexibility. Um, and just when we think we've been super flexible, we have to be even more flexible. So I just, I really appreciate it. So many great conversations with teachers and students and, and parents, emails and calling um, with great questions. Uh, and everyone's been so understanding. Uh, we just appreciate that. Um, I also just wanna take a moment to um, acknowledge our fully remote teachers um, because they have worked really hard to overcome many obstacles. Uh, they're, you know, they're teaching in homes, basically, right? They're right, they're on stage, they're teaching in people's homes, they're learning new technology. Um, and I've been um, joining uh, fully remote classes and uh, over time and seeing the growth um, in the students and the, and the staff and becoming familiar with the technology. So uh, I think sometimes it's easy, they may feel forgotten because, um, you know, they're not, we're not waving to them while they walk by or, or seeing them in the parking lot or so they just kind of feel forgotten. So I wanna keep, keep them in our, in our minds as they're working very hard as well. 
Uh, I have one more just quick celebration. Um, I may have mentioned, alluded to this a month ago or so. Uh, Pond Cove is a participant in um, the Maine Health 5210 program. And um, that the 5210 program, it's a nationally recognized health and wellness program um, to increase eating and, and um, active in, in healthy living habits. And um, so the person that really oversees that at Pond Cove is Heather Kennedy, our health and wellness teacher, and she's just fantastic. Uh, so um, one thing that we wanna celebrate is that this year for the first time, um, we from the 5210 program, Pond Cove received gold medal status in the past. Um, we've had some bronze and, and silver medals. Um, and without getting into all the details of why that is, I was talking with Heather about it um, a while back. And she mentioned that one of the major reasons why we were able to reach that gold status is the expansion of our health and wellness program to the primary grades, which you know was um, was something that we that you supported in the budget just to increase her position um, by a little bit so that she could teach those classes as well. And so that that helped us to reach that status. So thank you for to the board and to the community for supporting that in the budget. It's making a big difference for our kids and our community. Uh, so long story short, uh, 5210 provides, uh, provides our parents with surveys to complete. Some of you may have filled those out in the past. Well, recently, um, one of those parent surveys was selected in a drawing. So the parent wins $100 and the school wins $1,000 um, to enhance our health and wellness programming. So um, I know Heather is really excited about that. And uh, so pretty soon we're gonna be having conversations about our needs and, and, and kind of, figuring out what we'd like to purchase for materials or equipment with that thousand dollars. And we all do know that every, every penny counts. So, and I know Heather and is really excited about that. Um, so finally, just, you know, we're, we're in the process. We're just about done collecting data. Parents have been responding to, as to whether they would elect fully remote or hybrid programming. Um, if we are still in the hybrid model, um, which we anticipate we will be after for the second semester. So we're collecting that information and we're eager to right after vacation, um, analyze that to determine, you know, if there are a lot of changes, if we need to change the structure of what we're doing. Uh, so we, we're being very thoughtful about that. So we're ready for any changes necessary for the second semester. Um, and that's, but, and of course, our hope is that all students are back 100% as soon as possible, as always. Um, that is all I have for tonight. Does anyone have any questions for me? Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations to Heather Kennedy and Con Cove. Great yeah. job. That's exciting. Uh, Marcy. Great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, the business office will be processing all final invoices for the CARES Act grants over the next few weeks, as well as our other federal grants. So we'll hit our timeline for that. Our audited financials are on schedule to be distributed during January, possibly the last week of December. So we have that to look forward to. Yes, we look forward to weird things in the business office. So. <laughs> The other major task at hand for the rest of this month in January is preparing initial budget requests for consideration. And that will be happening. Those means we start, we'll start in January. So for my monthly financial report tonight, the percentage of the year that has occurred as of November 30th is 42% of the year. The total general fund expenditures at this point in time are at 38.7%. The average percentage spent at this time for the past five years is 39.10% spent. So we are right in line with the average spent over the past five years. The range between what has been spent and the percentage for the year at each point in time since August has been a three point range, which is a good place to be and we will continue to watch um, each month to make sure we are staying within that range and not exceeding. The category of other instruction 
continues to be our widest variance when you look at last year compared to this year. Last year at this time, other instruction was at 28% spent and this year we are at 19.8%. This is the budget article where our athletic expenses live. So this could change um, now that you've heard tonight the report from Jeff Thorak uh, that things are picking up a little bit. And so that could that variance might change um, moving forward. And on the revenue side, we're, we're keeping a, a close eye on the activity fees for the middle school and high school. And um, I'll be able to determine what our exposure will be uh, if we have a shortfall after we get through the winter sports. So we'll keep a close eye on that. Other than that, revenues are just as planned. And that concludes my report tonight, if there are any questions. Yeah, go ahead, Elizabeth. I see your hand. Marcy, this may be a question for you, it may be for Perry, but um, how were we doing with um, being able to encumber the, um, the funds that needed to be um, encumbered or spent or whatever by December 30th for those um, uh, ventilation projects I think Donna was talking about? Can anybody, uh, were we able to make this happen? Would you like, Donna, do you want to respond or do you want me to well, respond? Go ahead. Okay, we have been meeting with um, uh, Perry and Donna and our engineers weekly. We are hopefully on target at this point, Elizabeth, to be able to say we are positive and hopeful. We have some of the, um, Perry, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's called the uh, electrical work that's being taken care of ahead of time before the equipment actually arrives. Did I say that right, Perry? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Great, and um, so we are hopeful. We have an issue with the um, supply chain that I might have to um, follow up on, but as far as we know right now, the equipment will be here hopefully on time and fingers crossed with a lot of hope, everything's going great, Elizabeth. So you can uh, tell me. Are we able to encumber those expenses, even if there's that interruption to supply chain, if we anticipate being able to um, finish those projects? That's what I'm currently working with Colby Engineering on. And um, we're kind of like almost every day trying to figure out that plan to make sure that that can happen. Great, thanks for that update. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Can you just remind the public of how much we received under the CARES? Do you have that number? Yes, I do. Um, we received four different CARES Act grants. Uh, we received the first one um, is called the CARES Day, the Coronavirus Relief Funds is what the umbrella is. We received 57,000 for the CAPE Care, the day programming um, to help with the hybrid learning for teachers and, and daycare issues. That was 57,000. We received, uh, the first set of money was the CARES Act money for 23,000, if I have that number right. And that money we have until um, next September to spend. So we haven't spent that or committed yet, but we will be making sure that goes to good use. Um, the other grants, they're called CRF number one and CRF number two. One of them is 1 million, 72,000, if I have that number right. And the other one is 1,098,000. And so both of those, we have been working on uh, steadily to get spent by December 30th. All of these, the pressure has been on to make sure everything was spent and everything received by December 30th to comply with the federal government regulations. And we also, I just wanted to point out, um, Superintendent Wolfram and I had uh, applied for an additional, additional $50,000 that we were notified that we were awarded after we applied uh, to go towards our ventilation project to help with additional labor costs that will probably have to take place in order to have things smoothly for the students, less interruption, but it will require some weekend work so the additional 50,000 was awarded to us to help with that part of the process. So I think I listed all of the grants for us, Heather. Yeah, 
That's great. Thank you for that reminder and update. And thank you for overseeing that and finding that money for us when you did. You're welcome. Um, that's great work. Moving on, we have um, Kathy Stankert, our Director of Teaching and Learning. There she is. Hi, good evening, everyone. I have updates in four areas. I'm gonna start with instruction. Um, as you know, we've been fortunate that instruction can, can continue in a hybrid as well as remote learning model. And um, we have used a portion of the CRF funds that Marcy just mentioned to support student learning by acquiring additional instructional resources. Most recently, we've purchased leveled reading text for students in grades one and two, Brain Pop for grade four, DBQ Online for middle school social studies teachers, online Scholastic for middle school world languages teachers, and the Upbeat Music app for the middle school band. We've also purchased Ed Puzzle for all middle school teachers and students, Nearpod and Pear Deck for middle school and high school teachers and students, and Book Creator and Padlet um, for the high school. So we are making good use of those CRF funds in the area of instruction as well as ventilation and all those other things that are important. Um, and where needed, we will be providing uh, professional development on some of those programs in, in January, February. Some are intuitive and some require a little bit, little bit of, uh, of professional development for, for teachers to feel comfortable using them. So the second area that I wanted to update you on is standardized assessments, the annual testing that is required of our English language learners to measure progress in reading, writing, listening, and speaking is going to begin uh, right after the break. Um, the annual testing in ELA and math that you're all familiar with uh, for students in grades three through eight and 11, that remains up in the air. The main Department of Education um, is hopeful of securing a waiver for this spring's testing as they received a waiver uh, for last spring, but they are not planning to take any action um, or they don't anticipate any action occurring until after the presidential inauguration, but they are hopeful we'll, we will get that. Um, in the meantime, they've canceled their contract with the company that administered Empower Me, which was the assessment given in ELA and math to students in grades three through eight. Um, and they are in negotiations to replace that assessment with one given by an unnamed vendor. But what I can tell you is that it is very likely that the vendor selected, assuming the negotiations are successful, is one that will be very familiar to Cape Elizabeth's families. And I hope to have more information on that for you next month. The third area is professional development. Troy mentioned that last Wednesday, we used our, our half day to identify school-based actions aligned to the district strategic plan goals and outcomes. And I'm sure that you'll be hearing much more about that uh, in the months to come. Um, the next half day Wednesday is not until February 3rd and we anticipate using that for diversity, equity and inclusion, which is my fourth area to update you on. Um, so at the last meeting of the DEI task force, um, we adopted a set of norms um, that are drawn primarily from a book entitled Courageous Conversations About Race, which I highly recommend. Um, those norms, as well as our mission statement and the list of DEI task force members, now including Jen, welcome Jen, um, has been posted to the website. Um, and I'm gonna continue to update that so you can uh, follow along with us in real time. Um, those bi-weekly meetings will continue after the break. And again, I look forward to updating you on our progress. Thank you, Kathy. Thank Are there you. any questions? Thank you. All right. Donna, would you like to speak? Please. Well, I think it's, it's Del's turn next. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Del's turn. My apology, Del. Thank you, Heather. Um, I don't have a whole lot tonight. I do want to recognize staff in all three on all three teams in all three buildings. The special education staff are working extremely hard and have been since September in, the, in that they are delivering services to fulfill IEPs in their entirety. 
um, even though we're in a hybrid learning model. And so staff, um, as I've mentioned before to the board, are flexing in and out of in-person and remote on a daily basis, as well as providing interventions on Wednesday mornings. So, um, and staff have done a wonderful job. The other piece is that for those students who we've collected evidence that they're unable to gain a meaningful benefit from any remote instruction, um, those students are uh, receiving additional time in person. And again, I, I need to thank the administrators for being flexible to allow this in each building. And we've had to get creative. Space is at a premium um, for a lot of reasons. Many of those reasons are special ed staff that don't normally have a space, need a space so that they can pump out remote instruction and principals in each building have had to get very creative in finding space and or coming up with the rotating schedules for the limited spaces they do have. And uh, they have all done a very good job. And uh, it hasn't been just special education students, um, other students that are struggling with the remote have had been able to come in and been able to access their remote from within the building, uh, particularly at the high school level. And all of that has um, certainly improved the quality of instruction that we're, we're producing. I just want to say, I couldn't be more proud or impressed with special education teams in all three buildings. Um, I did want to just kind of give you a review of the numbers. We're currently servicing 173 students in special education. We have 11 students in referral across the district. Um, we have one student that's outplaced at a special purpose private school. And um, for those of you who monitor those numbers, the 173 is uh, a bit of an uptick with regard to the number of special education students, but we are still uh, at a, approximately 11% and the state average is just under 19%. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Dow. Now, Donna. Now it's my turn. Yeah. So as we uh, look to the holiday break next week, I just wanted to thank all of our staff for the outstanding job they've done in our effort to keep our schools open and to provide our students with education. A really special heads up to our uh, uh, heads up to the nurses who have uh, spent cal countless extra hours at night and on weekends doing the contact tracing. Um, they get, they have really stepped up to the plate and spent hours and hours um, on this contact tracing, calling parents and staff. Um, I just wanna really thank them. To our principals who have participated in our planning sessions, we have to do, um, last minute get togethers uh, to figure out what we're gonna do to address uh, different situations that have come up. And a um, uh, shout out to Perry and Chris who worked on, on the alternate bus schedule last week um, in just a few hours uh, arranged for a bus schedule that made it possible to have our students in school last week. By law, we have to transport our K to eight students. And so if we couldn't, have gotten them to school, we would have had to cancel um, school for, for last week. So uh, we called in substitute bus drivers and we had uh, our own Joe Doan driving a bus. We just were trying to pull all the resources we can, but um, thanks to parents who transported their students and Perry and Chris and the principals who were out um, and staff who were out meeting the buses and um, getting the students up on and off the buses quickly. Um, it, it did work. So just thank you for all who stepped in. Uh, the bus drivers did, the substitute bus drivers did double bus routes so that everyone could get to school. So it was really a, a team effort. And I just like, want to thank everybody for that. The PAL superintendents have started working on our common calendar for the 21-22 school year. Um, you remember that we can only have five dissimilar days with all of the sending schools, I believe it's 11 or 12 now, who send students to PAS. Uh, so we were able to create a draft calendar uh, that falls within the, the five, uh, no more than five dissimilar days. So after the holiday break, 
uh, we will call together the calendar committee to uh, look at the, the draft calendar and to review that. Uh, tonight, uh, you'll be hopefully approving the emergency management plan. Uh, we also have a policy that addresses that policy EBCA. So according to state statute, each school board shall annually approve a comprehensive emergency management plan. And this plan was developed, um, we've worked on it for the past several years uh, with input from staff and administration, local fire officials and law enforcement. Last year, we had Cumberland County emergency management officials come and do an audit of our plan. And we were planning in last April to do a large tabletop that Cumberland County uh, emergency management was going to organize um, where we would be given a situation and then talk about how our plan would address that situation. Of course, that had to be canceled, uh, but sometime in the future, hopefully we'll be able to do that. Our plan contains the roles and responsibilities of school administrators, teachers, and staff, the designated chain of command during an emergency, as well as strategies for conveying information to parents and the general public. Uh, the specific details of the plan are confidential in order to ensure the safety of our staff and students. And this year we have added a pandemic section for the plan. So that is a new piece, but um, basically the plan has been updated with um, tele updated telephone numbers and contact people. Um, so those were the big changes and the academic, um, the pandemic section on uh, the plan. Um, as Kathy said, um, and I think Troy talked about it on December 9th and Wednesday PD, the staff at each school met to work on action steps that each school would take as we work toward the goals outlined in the strategic plan. And uh, administrators will report out their progress toward these goals um, and completing their action steps at the June school board workshop. Uh, we have started the principal search and applications are due on January 7th. We've gotten quite a few in from all over the country. So that is moving forward. Any questions? Thank you, Donna. Um, we have new business. Do I have a motion for item 7A? I move we approve the building committee recommendation. I have a second. I second it. Okay. Um, so we have invited, where is she? Right there. Jen Grimek and Andy Patton, who is in attendees. Donna, can you give him the ability to speak and move over to a panelist? Um, both Andy and Jen were on the committee. I'll let them uh, introduce themselves a little bit, but they're going to tag team a little bit and um, talk about this recommendation. So Jen, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Jen Grimmick. Uh, just a little brief intro. Um, I'm a community member and a mother of a second grader at Pond Cove. And I have a three and a half year old who will be going to school soon. Um, I'm also, uh, have been a structural engineer for the last 17 years and mostly in the Boston area, but now working in Portland and I've done a handful of school projects. Um, currently working on the Arlington High School in Arlington, Massachusetts. So uh, I have some knowledge and expertise in building new schools. Um, so that's my introduction. Should, should, I, should we go to Andy or do you want me to say the charge? No. Why don't you go ahead with the charge? Okay. So the charge of the building committee is to review the needs assessment report, determine priorities, determine the size and scope of a future building project and bond, and then make a re recommendation to the school board. And so then we have Andy here um, who can speak, introduce himself in a moment. He's gonna talk about the process um, that got us to this recommendation. It didn't happen just in a week. Um, there was a lot to it. So Andy, you're allowed you to- okay? 
I can hear you just fine. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you Great. for being Thank here. Thank you. I, I don't have a video, but I'm sure you can hear okay. me. Um, so I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Andy Patton, and I came into the building committee and so from a slightly different perspective in that um, my wife and I moved to the town about four years ago, and we're the parents of three adult children. We raised our families in uh, just outside of uh, Boston. And um, I also, uh, we came here as a, because it was obviously it's a beautiful town, but also because of its multi-generational kind of uh, approach and all kinds of, you know, many different kinds of populations here. It's certainly not a retirement community from, from our perspective. Uh, from a community standpoint in my previous work, I became interested in, in this particular committee because I was a 10 year member in a, in a town meeting form of government down in this community, as well as uh, I spent three years on the finance committee of a 15 member finance committee in the town. And I spent the last year as a chairperson. And our primary job was to uh, review the budgets of various departments, but with a lot of specific focus on uh, town projects and building projects. So I have um, a lot of experience around looking at projects and understanding them and making sure that a particular process is followed because I believe strongly that you have a whole lot of stakeholders in these towns and you have also, um, you know, constituents from, from all sides, including uh, students and teachers. So from, from my perspective, I knew that the town had a, uh, you know, a history of, uh, of, of school building buildings, but I look at this from a, a two-year perspective and I have been very comfortable with the process that I've seen so far. Um, people and the residents and other listeners here need to recognize that this process really uh, started on this latest round back in uh, the fall of 2018. And as a person with never having set foot in any of the buildings, it's well documented on the building community website, the meetings that were held and the tours that were given by the students and the teachers. And we got a chance to look at uh, everything from food service to the cafetoriums to the music programs, the special ed program, the athletics. And, you know, it became very, very clear to me um, as a never having walked in these buildings that they were deficient in a lot of different ways. Um, fast forward to uh, 2019, and, you know, we have this wonderful needs assessment that I think really put into words what so many uh, people and, and townspeople should realize. And that is, is that it's a, you know, it was a 330 page, very in-depth document. Again, it's up on the website from the October 29th, 2019 um, meeting. And I really strongly suggest that people read through it to understand again, the process that was done and the analysis that was done, and even more importantly, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the testimony, I think, that was given from a lot of the teachers in, as, part of the, as part of the report. You know, unfortunately, we had a six or seven month delay, um, and then we started up this past fall. And I don't know if you want me to walk through, you know, how what some of the decision-making was with the four different choices, Heather, but, uh, or you want me to speak to, you know, how we arrived at the, at the, the conclusion we reached? No, I think it's just important to know that we were given four options. And as a group, we went through thorough discussion to, okay. to narrow it down. Okay. And I think there needs yeah. to be too much detail about that, but that it was thoughtful right. and contemplative and. Right, right. And, I, and ultimately I think, you know, Jen may be able to speak to it as well, but, um, you know, there were four options and, you know, again, that's, those are all publicly available documents. And, you know, the, the, the committee reached, uh, we reviewed everything from uh, just, just fixing the security issues in the cafetoriums to another option, which would have been a gut rehab to another option with 
two new school buildings being built very close to one another, as well as another one which would have uh, seen two new school buildings in the middle school, middle school and an elementary school. But the construction period would have been, you know, far more protracted in the eight to 10 year range. Um, I was convinced uh, by listening to the experts, by listening to people like Jen and other people that uh, the savings that took place, and this is just a personal impression, the savings that, that are going to be afforded, the different kinds of challenges that, 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 that schools are required now in terms of, in terms of uh, flexible teaching space and a whole host of other reasons, which I won't get into, plus the fact that I think there is such a thing as construction fatigue that can that can that can set in when you have um, you know a prolonged construction zone. So we arrived at a, at, a, at a decision that you know we can speak to. You can speak to Heather. That's great. I'm very I'm very comfortable with the process, and that's I think that's really the most important thing. Where we are right now, there's a lot of work to do, but I'm I personally am very comfortable with what I saw. Thank you, Andy. So Jen is back with the microphone to share the recommendation. Okay. Um, having carefully reviewed the facility needs assessment, having thoughtfully considered recommendations of industry experts, having discussed and debated goals, pros and cons of the options presented, the building committee recommends that the Pond Cove middle school structure be replaced and that ample funds be allocated for the renovation of a high school in order to allow it to function appropriately as it nears the end of its useful life. In particular, the committee recommends concurrent new construction of our lower school, middle school with a single bond and expedited timeframe. Thank you for that, Jen and Andy. Are there any comments from board members before we vote? Okay, I would like to sort of follow up on what Andy had mentioned and just say that I am proud of the work that was done. Um, I thought it was extensive and thorough and thoughtful. Um, I don't think this decision was made lightly. Uh, there is very deep understanding of um, what's being recommended here. Um, and there was a tremendous amount considered. So. Um, I wholeheartedly back this recommendation. And I'm not seeing other board members uh, raising hands right now. So I'm gonna Kimberly go ahead. With, hand up. I'm sorry? Kimberly has her hand up. Oh, I didn't see it. Go ahead, Kimberly. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I had raised it before you spoke. So it's, it's um, you know, kind of on the same lines, but um, it, um, I think it was a, a great um, process for the community to go through. I think we had, um, we had um, a lot of conversation um, looking at the pros and cons of each decision. Um, I think there were, um, there were strong opinions voiced um, and heard. And I think, um, I think in the end, um, we landed in a great place. And I think, um, I think it was a lot of work and a lot of time, a lot of time really more than anything um, that we asked of a whole bunch of people and um, super appreciative of all the involvement that we had. Um, and I, I think the um, decision that was brought to us today is uh, is a good one. Thank you, Kimberly. Anyone else? Okay, so voting. Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Bolts. Yay. Uh, Jennifer McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Okay. Moving on, item 
uh, 8B. May I have a motion, please? I move we approve the following 2020 to 2021 winter coaching positions as defined in our packet. I have a second. Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Um, as always, thank you for those members of the staff and community that step in to allow these activities to happen. Um, make sure I'm on the right page here. Okay, voting. Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Bill Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Cyphers. Yay. Cindy Volts. Yay. Jennifer McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Thank you. May I have a motion? Go for it, Laura. Okay. I move we approve the following extracurricular uh, stipend for the high school guidance department chair, Brandy Lapointe, and for Pond Cove guidance department chair, Megan O'Neill. I have a second. Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Okay, again, my gratitude goes out. And I would like to say, particularly in this year where we hear how busy teachers are, um, for those individuals willing and able to take on more work and fill these kind of roles. So thank you to uh, Brandy and Megan. Um, to the voting, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Volts. Yay. Jennifer McRae. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Um, okay, next up is a notice of retirees, and this is not celebration, this is just announcement, correct? So I'll just read through it, Donna. Um, Mary Poker Page, a social studies teacher for the Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, and then Ginger Raskiller for the technology integrator at the Cape Elizabeth High School, and Joan Moriarty, administrative assistant in the Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, there'll be time to speak to them later, correct? Okay. I just oh, to in June. In okay. June. That's what I thought. I just wanted to double check that something hadn't been prepared. Um, heading into policy, item 8E. May I have a motion, please? I move we approve policy GCMA instructional staff planning time. I have a second. Second. Who was it? Jen. Was that Jen? It, it was me, actually. Laura. <laughs> Okay, sorry, you were so fast. Um, any questions or comments? Elizabeth, are you able to speak to that? I can, because this is a second read, this should be familiar yep. to the board. Yep. Um, after our November board meeting, the policy committee received no feedback from the board, um, from teachers, from anybody. So it is um, a, a staff planning time policy that um, is that shows the board's um, support and commitment to planning time and understanding how important it is to our teachers. And um, we're happy that we're able to put this in our policy manual. Okay. Any questions? Okay, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Bolts. Yay. Jennifer McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Um, Elizabeth, are you prepared to continue or Donna? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Donna can if she wants. I, I brushed up because I knew Hope had left us. Yes. Elizabeth. <laughs> so 
Uh, for first reading, we have a student use of cell phones and other electronic devices. This is not a required policy, but it's one that we felt would be important to um, have. And um, so in your packet, you have a red line version. So it's been to the policy committee for um, work. We've had input from um, Erin Taylor in particular, who did her um, master's thesis on this and um, the principals as well, um, Jeff Shedd in particular. So um, what you're looking at is um, a policy really that isn't overly, um, prescribed or restricted because we want to allow the um, building administrators to uh, come up with or at least solidify the, the processes that really work for them and don't make it onerous for teachers or anyone in particular to be able to enforce. But we need to kind of est establish some norms for our school department. Um, so the... Um, I think I really kind of wanted to call attention to B because it was something that was um, most dear to Hope's heart and to my heart, which was around privacy and the use of cameras. So if you look, um, we really, we want students and staff to, to be ha have an expectation of privacy, um, especially in you know, certain areas. So we have you know, prohibited use of cameras, including camera phones or similar recording devices. Um, in locker rooms, bathrooms, and other places where privacy is generally expected. And um, we really want to try to have a culture of um, not just, you know, people just filming and posting and thinking that it's okay to, to do that when you haven't asked permission of other students. And it's not specifically, you know, oh, you have to go around and say, you know, hey, um, Heather, did, can I have permission? But just that understanding and, and raising that awareness that, you know, people have expectations of privacy. Um, really, it allows, it, it kind of is, it, it gives us a, a little bit of a backbone and allows each building pr principal to set guidelines so that, you know, there are times when, you know, if you're not using your cell phone appropriately or you're using it when you're not supposed to be using it, it may be con confiscated. And, you know, the policy is, is designed to back up our principals and back up our staff. So as always, we welcome comment <laughs> and input and it'll go back to policy committee and then we'll bring it back to you in January. That's great. And what a fortunate to have Aaron Taylor be an expert on this. Yeah, that's great. Um, any questions or comments about that for Elizabeth at this time? Yeah, I just have a quick question. It, um, there's been a lot written about this and I know there's a, some press articles in the last few years about different policies at different schools and how you, they treat this differently. And um, I like the direction this is going in, but it clearly does um, push the issue down the road a bit because it allows each building administrator to establish policies. Are there discussions that will be had or have been having at the policy committee level at what those would look like? Or is that really just being deferred to each building? Um, it just, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't say much yet, right? It just says they can't establish rules. And I'm just curious if that discussion has been going on now, or if it's, if it really is deferred until this is adopted. So I'm not going to speak for the principles, but it is my understanding that the, those procedures and rules kind of already exist. And so we're, we're allowing for those, um, I, and I think that we're trying to allow them because what is appropriate use of a cell phone at the high school is different from appropriate use at the elementary, for instance. So I don't know if Jeff or Troy or Jason want to talk a little bit about what, like, what already happens and, and might be in, in handbooks or going into handbooks shortly. I mean, I can see at the high school, um, teachers for some years uh, have certainly been empowered if students are misusing cell phones during class uh, to confiscate those for short periods of time. Um, and I think students understand that for the most part, uh, um, there was, as with many schools very long time ago, there was an effort to sort of ban them as being too much, too attention diverting. 
um, which they are to some extent, but at the same time, it's just not complete. It's not realistic at all to do that in this day and age. Um, and particularly with the hybrid situation we have right now, there's actually some utility to cell phones in terms of sometimes students need to use them for this or that connected to their education. So it's just really a matter of um, that the, the overall message and tone is that they, sh they should be compliments to what teachers are doing and aids to their families, but not distractions from what's going on in the school environment. So, so we navigate that the best we can. Um, and I think that that's laid out in some general language in the handbook, but I honestly have to say that it's been a while since I looked at it to see if that's the case. But uh, we, this, this policy will prompt us to do that examination and make sure we do have expectations spelled out in as much detail as we can. Yeah, but it's pretty much, I mean, it's pretty much like that at the middle school, even in the middle school, within the school, I mean, we have, fifth, sixth, seventh graders that are in much different places, maturity wise, and just what they have access to um, than even our eighth graders, which are definitely different than high school kids. So it is, I mean, this is always a struggle and a battle a little bit with cell phones, um, but we really have worked also on, like, I think the high school can have Snapchat, the middle school cannot have Snapchat. So there are some differences along the way um, and I think there are appropriate differences for, for the age level of our kids. We always can, you know, take a phone. Sounds, it sounds not great to take a phone, but there also is a little bit of inherent risk with that. I mean, these phones cost six, $700 sometimes. And if a teacher takes it and it's on their desk and it shows up missing, like, you know, who, who is really responsible for that phone at that point? And, you know, so it, it just goes down a kind of a, a windy road. So it really is about communicating expectations with kids parents ahead of time and, and kind of just working with them through it. But Jeff is also correct in a lot of our classes now we're using our cell phones, some, especially during COVID time. So um, I think it's really hard to have really steadfast rule, really kind of firm rules around it right now. Um, I think it's more about expectations, appropriate use, appropriate times, things like that for us at the middle school. And I can speak uh, briefly. This is one of those times where it's great to be an elementary school principal um, because we don't deal with it too much. Uh, but we do actually. Um, and our handbook says that uh, students can bring them and they need, they need to be in backpacks in lockers. Um, and that's just because a lot of parents want their fourth graders to have them for after school if they're going to the library or something like that. Uh, so we do run into issues sometimes, but our students are great. Um, they keep them in the backpacks. If there's a rare occasion where they don't, a teacher will, will keep it for them until the end of the day, give it back. But that's almost never happens. We usually just remind them, keep that in the backpack. Sometimes we have Apple watches and we do ask the students to take them off and put them in their backpack if they have accounts and they're texting and things like that, but it's rare. Um, but we do have a, we do have something in our handbook about it and it's about keeping them in the lockers all day. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments about the cell phone policy? Okay, may I have a motion? I move we approve the Cape Elizabeth School Department Emergency Management Plan. The revisions include staff changes and the addition of the pandemic plan. I have a second. I second. Thank you, Kimberly. Any questions or comments? I think Donna spoke quite a bit about it before. So, um, I'm not seeing any hands raised or any questions. Uh, Cindy, go ahead. I just want to mention, I have not seen the emergency management plan or had an opportunity to review it. Um, so I'd like to have that opportunity and I understand if we need to vote now, I, I'd be more comfortable abstaining from voting. No, I think I need to send an email out for people to stop in and, and look at it. Um, yeah, we did, and maybe the new board member didn't. Yeah, I just I just looked through my email and everything I've received to see if I could look through it, and I haven't 
Yeah, um, the nature of the confidentiality of it um, was not something that um, they wanted to send over email. Sure. And so it is there to be available. Um, and Donna, can we make it available for Cindy to- Oh, sure, yeah, it's, it's available. Yeah, okay. um, Jen too, if you would like to go um, and certainly feel free to abstain. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay, heading into a vote. Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Cypress. Yay. Cindy Volts is going to abstain. abstain. Okay. Uh, Jen McVeigh. I'm going to yay and trust that Hope and Nasir did their best on it. And I'm going to take a peek at it for future reference as well, if I have any comments for next time. Okay. So that was a yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Fantastic. Uh, moving on, are there any school board agenda requests at this point? We're in the home stretch, everyone. Seeing none, uh, committee reports. Pass, we have not met. Um, so there's nothing to report on that one. Policy, Elizabeth, is there more to share or do you think that you covered it all? I don't think there's more to share and um, I'm sure I'll be meeting with Donna to um, pick a date for January and we okay. will let you know. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the DEI, um, Kathy spoke to that quite a bit. Um, I wanted to add one more thing that I thought was a really beneficial discussion that came up. Um, and Kathy, feel free to chime in, but there, there were teachers that were interested, and I forget exactly who it was, but really asking some of the hard questions. Um, you know, talking about um, diversity and low income housing and how do we talk about all this and not to assume, not to make assumptions. Um, and so to have some of these more challenging conversations about, do you assume that a person of color falls into the low income housing? And um, you can't necessarily assume that, but yet another teacher or member of the committee was saying, yes, but a lot of the statistics show that they do fill those roles. And so how do you navigate that? And, and I just want to bring that up to um, commend the committee for their courage and strength um, and integri integrity for wanting to go to those difficult places and have those conversations, feeling safe enough in the group to do that um, and to just challenge themselves and the norms of how we've been doing things and being willing to have those conversations. It has to start there for us to then be able to have um, those kind of conversations outside. So I definitely wanted to add to that. Um, I was super proud and impressed and um, just blown away with the hearts that were in that meeting that, that day. So. Um, I see you shaking your head, nodding yes. Um, Kathy, do you have anything to add to that or did that sort of sum it up in your mind? I think you're muted. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, I was nodding because I was thinking that when I, so I agree with everything you said. When I talked about the adoption of the norms, it occurred to me after that people might assume that by norms I meant things like um, meetings will start on time and end on time. But in fact, and that's why I do encourage people to look at the norms that the task force adopted um, and the four from the courageous conversations on race particularly, because one of them is, is um, actually to experience discomfort um, and that to expect and accept not, um, uh, what's the word, uh, non-closure, right? So, and I just think that what you're talking about was uh, illustrative of that point. Um, and yeah, these are these are the conversations we need to be having. And those are ways for us to have them. Yeah, and Kathy, would you also agree? I felt like the last meeting was a pivotal point where prior to this, there was sort of like 
figuring things out, coming up with norms and sort of how we want to move through it. Um, talking about what is it, the, the language? What What is um, Melanie Thomas bringing in? A, a dictionary or a vocabulary? Oh, right. So the glossary of terms that the Civil Rights Committee is working on, actually. Right. The and town, the, right. Yeah, so that we can have some consistency. So it was a lot of setting up framework and information that now I think as we head into the New York New Year, um, we're going to get down to some of the real work um, and use all of what we've built up this fall to, to make some headway forward. Would you agree that we're at a pivotal point in this task force? I, absolutely. Yeah. And I would invite um, anyone else, um, Jeff or Donna, if you want to um, speak to that as well. But yeah, I do. And as, as I say that, I also don't want to diminish, there has been lots of work done by individual teachers um, and groups um, with students already. Um, so I don't want to make that sound like there hasn't been a lot of effort already. I'm sort of referring more to as a, as, as a task force, the direction, the path that we're taking. Um, so I don't want that to be misunderstood. So that was my only, and as, um, as Kathy mentioned earlier, we did commit as a group to meet um, twice a month starting in January that the work um, is worthy of that. So we decided once a week might be a little much um, and once, once a month was a little not quite enough. So that's where that is. Um, the building committee, I think we've spoken enough about that. Um, but one thing I would like to say about the building committee is that it might be a little bit quiet for a little bit as we sort of organize and figure out the next steps and, and plan for where it's heading. So if you don't hear about this in the next week or month, um, don't worry, there's gonna be conversations happening to, to move us forward. Um, announcements for upcoming meetings. Um, the next school board workshop is December 22nd. At no, that's, that's not yeah. right. I was going to say, are we having? I was going to say, no, no. that's not in there, is that? Okay, no. thank you, Donna. Thank goodness. Whew. It was on my calendar, so I was meaning to ask about that tonight, yeah. well, actually. Well, yeah. It's like, we are not making these administrators come no. on December 22nd, no. are we? <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Donna. Uh, so then we have one more motion. I'm going to ask Laura. Go for it. Gosh. I move we adjourn. I have a second. Anyone? New person. I second it. Thank you, Jen. Uh, any questions or comments? I just have to say that. All right. Heather Altenberg's a yay. Kimberly Carr? Yay. Phil Saucier? Yay. Elizabeth Seyfries? Yay. Lee Volts? Yay. Jennifer McVeigh? Yay. And Laura Danino? Yay. Thank you to everyone, and I hope you have a great holiday and a wonderful vacation. Thank you so much. Take care, Happy everyone. Happy holidays. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.